Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Smallville Chronicles. This week is titled Hothead. I am your host, Lou Gonzalez. The other half of this world's finest, my co-host, Alan Muir. I get by with a little help from my friends. <laughs> is there a specific thing that's inspiring your Beatles reference? Uh, I, can, I can't do uh, Joe Cocker because his voice is, is really hard to imitate. Well, unless you've smoked uh, 50 packs of cigarettes and had a whole bottle of Jack, I don't think you could. <laughs> yeah, mainly because of the 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 big guest star on this episode. I was I'm trying I was tr- trying to do, pay homage to his earlier work from the 80s, the Wonder Years. Oh yeah, the like I that completely went over my head, and I feel really dumb. <laughs> All right, so, like I said, this week's episode is Hothead, Uh, so it's an interesting episode. I personally think there's a lot of things in this episode that wouldn't fly in uh, today, but uh, so let's start off. Uh, I don't think, as of right now, there's anything from the last episode to correct, Um, so we can go right into the main plot, unless you have anything else. No. Right, yeah, because you got your stories at the end. So, our main plot, basically, we have a pretty lengthy main plot and then several little B-plots going on in this episode. So, our main plot is Coach Arnold. Uh, He's the coach of the Smallville Crows. He's trying to get his 200th win. We see him get 199, where he flips out on Whitney because he doesn't run the play he wants him. And that kind of gives us an idea of who he is. Uh coach has been there so long the school has bought him his own sauna in this high school in kansas we get to see him relax after his 199th win uh in the sauna throw some water on the sauna rocks and they're green and we get a nice green mist and coach gets to bathe in the warmth uh we're then introduced to principal kwan who will be with us for a couple of episodes he's another comic book tv show all-star he confronts coach about a bunch of his players cheating Seven, Coach, to be specific. Yes, seven players cheating, um, even though later on we do see eight. Uh, yeah. Um, and then Clark and his dad get into, Clark wants to play football, he gets confronted by Coach, um, basically gets into play, we see Clark at practice, he's running over people and destroying them. Well, uh, the, the first thing we see, the the whole reason that Coach Arnold goes to try to can recruit Clark to the team. Someone from the football team tries to throw a f- the football at Chloe's face and Clark intercepts that shit. Yeah, he one hand Odell Beckham's it like it's nothing. And he throw he he casually tosses it back at a very very fast speed. Yeah, and he almost knocks the guy down. Yeah, he it's let let's just say that if it was if it was airing now, he would have been hit instead of getting hit in the chest. He would have gotten hit in the groin. So this main plot really goes around the coach, uh, the players being suspended, him trying to get his two hundred win because he's just going to retire. We also see for the first time, really compared to the first two episodes, we got a little hints at Chloe's investigative journalism. We get a lot more of that in this episode. Um, she, that's why the player throws the ball at her she's taking pictures of them and she goes to throughout the episode does some uh investigating she overhears one of the players later on and her whole investigation really ties in and starts to bring clark into this kind of wall of weird thing that was happening um but basically coach attacks the new principal we learned that he's only been principal for six months um and tries to light him or when he gets addressed he slams his hands on the desk and the Thing lights on fire like a hibachi grill um, which is weird and later on he tries to also kill the coach by trapping him in his car and lighting it on fire you mean principal the, yes the pr- coach tries to burn the principal alive um, luckily pete and clark are there and clark sends pete to go get help while he rips the door off and throws it across the parking lot and pulls the principal out who's taken to the hospital and actually we don't see for the rest of the episode because he's in the hospital unlike whitney from the last episode. Yeah. 
So before we get to the end, go over some of the interesting B-plot things. Uh, we get to hear a lot more about Jonathan's past, um, more kind of uh, look at how he was the star quarterback. Or no, he's the star uh, running back because Clark does mention that he's taking his old spot. Um, so Jonathan was the star, I believe he says like halfback or something, but yeah. he's the star running back of the team. And the coach knows him. Uh, Whitney even respects him um, and that he was this kind of high school hero. Um, this is what the coach uses to get Clark to play. And Clark and then later on throws it back into Jonathan's face about like, of course you don't think it's a big deal because you actually got to do all this, which was a very interesting argument. And again, plays to the really in- most interesting part of this show early on, which is the relationship between Clark and his parents, especially with Jonathan. Um, we do get to hear Martha address Jonathan about this and say that, you know, because Jonathan's afraid Clark's going to get taken away when she's like, you should be more afraid that you're going to push him away. So we also get to see our first kind of fight, like con- conflict. Yeah, conflict between the parents. And we get to see that although Martha does agree with Jonathan, she is a little bit more understanding of what he's uh, what Clark is going through. And then we do have two other side stories that are kind of character development for our other two main characters, I would say. I would say if you agree to everybody, Clark's obviously the star. The kind of next tier would be kind of tied between, like, Jonathan, Lex, and Lana. And then Chloe and Pete are kind of the next level down. Yeah, because Lana finds out about the whole thing, and Winnie doesn't care. Yeah, the cheating. Yeah, she finds out about the cheating on the exams. Thing. And she decides to quit the cheerleading squad, and yep, and, she, and, deci- and she trades her pom poms for tips at a coffee shop. Yeah, I, they don't really say if it's like a chain or if it's the local one, but for some reason, everybody in high school from all four grades goes there and slams coffee. And Lex also hangs out at this place with all these young teenagers. Again. Like we said in the last episode, why is Lex hanging out with yeah, these 15-year-old kids? does not make sense. No, not at all. But we do get a good scene of the three of them, kind of this Clark's other group of friends, and the main core of the show for the first several seasons, kind of talking to each other about their problems. Um, Lana dealing with her aunt um, and not wanting to follow in necessarily their footsteps, while Clark wants wants to follow in his father's footsteps and stands up to his father, and then Lex trying to deal with his story, which is Lionel sends in guy Dominic to and some other random Luther Corp guys to yell at him and tell him to fire. It, Lionel's yes man. Yes, to fire 20% of the, uh, the staff at the fertilizer plant, I believe it is. I'm not I sure. Know. All I know is that Chloe's dad works there. Yes, I can't remember. We do end up learning what plant it is, but it's like the one Luther Corp plant, and it basically employs a good chunk of the population of Smallville. Yeah, and he and instead of firing, instead of following his father's wishes, he goes against his father's wishes and decides to hire more people. Yes, he and, doubles. He, he doubles down and mentions that, he, or he predicts that the sector will have a turnaround. And more money will be made. Yep. And we get our first really good, um, we get our first, we get our return of Lionel Luther. We actually have more than we've gotten the pilot. Um, he himself comes down to address Lex on doing this. And of course, like every father does when his son doesn't listen to him, challenges him to a fencing match. Which we get to... this, this again, take this sort of, they do, they do an homage to this in season 10 again in the Luther episode. On Earth 2? Mm. Um, so in this first, well, in this fencing match, uh, Lionel wins and basically dresses down Lex for being too emotional and being soft and saying that there are, you know, no one, you know, kind of giving him a lesson in business. And basically by the time we get after our meetup with Lex, Lana, and Clark, Lex breaks down the numbers and figures out a way to still keep everyone employed as well as cut production costs by 20%. So we get a return of Lionel, who challenges this idea, and Lex basically addresses him down and says, you're just mad that you didn't think of it. And we get this real look at the competitive nature of Lex and Lionel, where it's less of a father-son and more of a... Boss, uh, or manager, and subordinate. 
Yeah, I kind of thought of it more, I don't know if they ever bring it up, like this kind of lion relationship where you have like the old lion and then you have this new young one. And Lionel both wants his son to be just as ferocious as him, but just not as, because he still wants to be on top. It's this weird kind of, Lionel has this very weird relationship with Lex because he wants him to be as ruthless and as business minded as him but at the same time still wants to be the top yeah and in season seven half or halfway through season seven it let's just say it kind of happens yes all right so back to our main plot so that's going on all between this so basically uh the coach finds out from the principal before he tries to burn him that one of the kids one of the players is a rat um, it's pretty easy to figure out because uh, it's the only player that gets named, which is Trevor. Um, Chloe overhears them while they're at the coffee shop and finds out that the coach called them to a secret meeting at the field where he addresses eight players. Um, Coming to, and, and this brings in one of my favorite effects. Yes. Um, while Chloe sits behind something and videotapes the whole thing on her terrible little camcorder, the coach berates the players. I think it's one. I think she's on the. Uh, it's like an early camcorder that you can watch what you're filming like yeah. with a flip screen, but it's square. It's very 2001. Definitely. Um, so coach berates the players. Trevor speaks up because you know he's the only one that has a name. Coach uh, immediately slaps him across the face, and we see the sprinklers go from water, well, intermittently turn from water to flamethrowers. And all the players are scared the shit out of while he admits that he gave them the test because who cares? He just wants to get his 200th win. Yeah, cause he, and as he's as he points, as he says throughout the entire episode, he's been there for 25 years. Yeah, and, he's a he's a staple of the community. And when the principal is t- talking, as before the principal gets roasted, literally, he said that he tried. He tries to. He said that he tried to. Have have Coach Arnold suspended, and he mentions that he has a, a lot a lot of friends in high places, and he and Coach Arnold remarks, "Yeah, because I coached all of them." So he's kind of in the uh, in the Midwest. It football is taken very seriously, so it's very easy to see why. The football coach is more important, can be seen as more important than a principal. Yeah, this is kind of um, another time where we get to see or get reminded that Smallville is in Kansas. And we get to see that this is middle America, even though the school is extremely diverse, um, especially for 2001. But yeah, we get to see that people care more about what the football team is doing than anything else. Um. So there was a lot going on here still. So basically, Chloe goes to put these papers in the school newspaper, which is the Smallville Torch. And while she's doing this, the coach walks up to the fire exit, which apparently the newsroom has, and lights her early iMac color uh, on fire in the rest of the room while everybody else is at the pep rally. Clark uh, overhears Chloe. He's the only one to hear her from the window, although it's not super hearing as far as I can tell. Races up to the room, goes into another entrance that's in the room, and then we get to see the fire die down. And Coach walks away, and we see the pullout of like emergency exit for fires only. Yeah, and something you didn't mention is that when Coach Walt does this, he ha- he has his he places his. Uh, Two, two of his fingers on his temple. Oh, yes. He's, he uh, fire starters it and total tries to do his best psychic impression. I don't know who told him to do that, but it actually, I, it actually made him more, like, it made his perform- performance much better. Yeah, because he's definitely, it implies that he's in control and that he's purposely doing this, as opposed to um, the first time we see him use his power is a complete accident. And there's other times when it's a total accident. But when he does it with the principal and to Chloe, he is in full control. Actually, I don't even know if the principal is in control because I don't think he does the finger thing yet. He realizes he's doing it, but he's still just kind of staring at him like pissed off. 
So we see this confrontation. All of Chloe's evidence is burned away, but she does reveal that uh, since she saw the coach attack Trevor, that she thinks Trevor is the one that will give away the information. But she says Trevor won't talk to her. He'll only talk to one of his. So since now Clark is on the football team, he goes to confront Trevor, who is hiding in his garage, surrounded by a fort made out of fire extinguishers. Yeah, I, I, kind of, I, can, I, admit, I, I have to admit that was kind of funny. Yes. And Clark notices his arm is wrapped. And cause yeah, because earlier, Coach lowly brands him with his uh, hand hands and hammer prints. Yeah, which... Just goes to one of my problems in this episode I'll address later on, but it is weird. So we see the burnt handprint of the coach on Trevor's arm. Clark goes to confront the coach and says that, like, I saw the burn. Coach is chilling out in his sauna, which has, again, the meteor rocks. So Clark gets weak. Coach. Well, it's it's not so much that Coach, that coach Arnold attacks Clark. More of Clark kind of starts this, and he kind of starts it off by saying i'm not playing today and or i'm not i'm not going out there today and neither are you so he kind of had it coming <laughs> yeah he definitely is, about it. he's the one that confronts confronts the coach and the coach is kind of like because clark's weekend shoves him in and traps him in there hoping i guess he's hoping he dies he from being in the sauna yeah he punches him uh, i think he throws him against like the other the uh, other side of the sauna and like man superman is getting beat up by an by a by an old man. Oh, yes. Now, is he wearing just the towel? I'm trying I, ho- to I hope so. Yeah, because then he's basically being beaten by a naked old man, which is pretty ridiculous. But this show, especially at this point, is extremely ridiculous. Um, so Clark is stuck in the sauna, dying from both the heat and the kryptonite. And we again see the awesome kryptonite hand thing from the previous episode, which looks great. Jonathan and Martha show up the game. They see Chloe. Chloe says that Clark never showed up. They have no idea what's going on. And Chloe... Or he, he goes to, to, to Pete and asks where's Clark. Pete says, I don't know. Coach Arnold tr- tries to get rid of Jonathan by saying he doesn't. He's not like the man you were or something. No, no. He just says he's not allowed on, on the field because parents aren't allowed on the field. So Chloe decides to take to uh, tell, inform Jonathan of her, what she's seen. And at this time, Clark is throwing rock, the meteorite rocks at the uh glass window or the yes. glass yeah glass yeah the window. window and the window and the door yeah jonathan and he breaks the glass and jonathan comes by he notices that the, the glass is broken Caesar's clark gets him out but as he's getting him out he gets attack he gets hit in the back by coach arnold who uh, kicks jonathan's ass too yeah well he kind of sucker punches him to start with and then basically now clark is all souped up doesn't he hit him with a fire extinguisher or something i think the coach hits jonathan with a fire extinguisher because i know he starts hitting clark with it and now since they're out of the sauna clark just kind of eats the shot he he kicks him through uh one of the glass windows yeah they got off like a like a locker room window into the coach's office which the coach just kind of eats and gets up and is just mad and, everything lights on fire and we and again bad bad uh, the budget of the show yeah which and he basically he just responded well not even spontaneous he just combusts and he burns himself to death well no he the whole room lights on fire around and him Clark and... walks through the fire oh yeah the bad green screen but Clark doesn't do it he just kind of like stands there and lets the coach roast himself alive he if i'm not mistaken he he tries to hit him and clark knocks him into the wall of the where the wall or the shower wall Yes, because we get another scene of, like, where water should be, it's fire. Yeah, and that's... And we're not told what happens to Coach Arnold, whether or not he he dies or is just horribly burned. I believe he's dead, because I think he gets addressed in several episodes later. Because they mentioned that Co- he, Coach Arnold won the game and he wasn't even there to see it. I'm trying to see if they say... I think he dies. I'm pretty sure he dies, because I think it's addressed... Because I believe he's the first of, like, rotating faculty at the high school. Who start dying. Yeah, who start dying or become... He's also the first of the school, like, a faculty that be- becomes powered and becomes a villain. Yeah. All right. And basically, it's, again, for the third episode in a row, Clark really doesn't beat the bad guy as much as the bad guy beats himself. As well as the bad guy seemingly dying at the end of the episode, and this one in the last episode. It, not the pilot though. He, he no, he, not the pilot. He survives. Yeah, he goes. He goes back to. Well, we not we never find out what happens to him. No, he just kind of gets a reset button hit on him. All right. So that was basically this episode set up for next week. The only real setup was kind of Lex and Lionel. I think talking about the factory um, because that factory becomes a huge plot point throughout this season. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a uh, I think it's the season finale, or the episode, the pro- penultimate episode, episode of season one. He, uh, I won't say what happens, but it's just hysterical because of the way John Glover plays it. Um, <laughs> should we get into my myself and my my family's history with Dan Loria? Yes. So my sister worked worked at a local um, like drive through area. Where or it's a, it was a drive it was sort of a mix of a convenience store where and a drive through, and one one day she's someone pulls up and it's him. It's the dad from the one of yours. Then, uh, my mom and my brother are at CVS. Who are they bumping to? But Dan Loria. Uh, my brother again is at Seven Eleven. Who is he bumping to? Dan Loria. And about. Uh, a, a few years ago, we went to, it was New Year's Day, and we went to the local diner, and my mom says to me, hey, it's Dan Loria. And I turn, I, I turn up, like, I turn up, I look, look over my shoulder, and I'm like, oh my god. And me being the, 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 the biggest, me being the nerd I am, I start pl- playing this episode of Smallville, like, hoping that he notices, he didn't notice. <laughs> and I... I had my mom tell, like, I was, I, I couldn't muster up the nerve, the, the nerve to speak to him, or the effort to speak to him, because I was just so starstruck, and I was like, just tell him I was watching his episode, the episode he, of Smallville he was on, and I, and I was, it was fantastic, and she did, and, and I also asked if he, if he, if he remembers it and everything, he, and I was told, and my mom told me that it was, to him it was just a paycheck. <laughs> and I think he was joking too. Oh, like he was joking that it was just a paycheck. Yeah, because oh, that's cool. the uh, the next year, I mean, he he has family here on Long Island, I believe, and oh. he like his mother lived in the same area I live in. It's I just it's it's just one of those things where you never think I was and like I was so mad too because I love the Wonder Years. And I pretty much love everything that Dan Loria is in, whether it's Bronx is Burning, Pitch, The Spirit. <sighs> <laughs> Sorry, I like looked up his Wikipedia, and it, that's the first movie that it lists under it as like what he's known from. <laughs> not Wonder Years. That's number two. <laughs> <laughs> Someone at IMDb does not like him, I guess. Yeah, but still, yeah. it was. That's cool. Yeah. Also, there was also another thing about this episode, like during the filming of it. 9-11 happened. Yep. Oh, I was going to get to that, too. Yes, it did. Um, did you see, at least what I looked up, um, I guess in an interview, Annette O'Toole said that, you know, while they were filming, 9-11 happened, and I guess uh, her she had to have uh, her husband, Michael McKean, drive her to and from Vancouver since there was no planes that were active during this time. Yeah, and it was during those car rides that they wrote the songs for the movie *A Mighty Wind*, which um, was nominated for an Oscar for best original song, or not an Oscar, Academy Awards of best music. And Michael McKean, of course, you know from *Spinal Tap*, *Better Call Saul*, like and *Smallville*. Oh yeah, does he appear in *Small*? Oh, Perry he White. definitely. Is. Oh yeah, that's awesome. All right, um, I guess we could break down. Uh, is there anything else from your story or anything else? Or... Uh, the, it's another Dan Loria thing, but it, he, Dan, Dan Loria's, like, Dan Loria's character on, in this episode has the same last name as the Wonder Years. Oh, I, yeah. I, I find that very funny. Yeah. I, think, I feel like they do that a lot in these shows, including, like, the CW stuff where they do lots of plays on stuff like that. Um, but... Let's go through our breakdown of the episode. Um, do you have any overall thoughts on the episode? The only thing I could kind of think of was that I don't know why it always bugs me in these shows, like any show like this. So when Clark is saving Co- or Principal Kwan, instead of just like ripping the door off and putting it down, he chucks it like across the parking lot. And I yeah, just don't understand he why. Saw, he could have killed somebody. Yes. Also, it's like, how did that car door get over there? Like, this was a car fire, not an explosion. Like, why is the door over there? If he, like, put it to the side, 
it could have been like, oh, it just fell off on its own because, like, the hinges burnt off. I don't know why. Those things just, like, annoy me. It's just like, oh, we need to make him, we need to really put it in there that he's super strong. But uh, did you have any overall thoughts on this episode, or? Yeah, I really liked it because it was, there were things that were said by one person, and then, that or there were there were two specific things. One with Lionel and and uh, Lex, and another with Clark and Lana. With Lionel and Lex, it was it was the sort of defense the fencing scene. He says what. Don't think you could take your old man. <laughs> and when, and then the Lex later on says, "What? Don't think you could take your own son." Another is, and the second one is when Lana is explaining about her, about wh- why she quit cheerleading. She said her her aunt did. Her aunt was a cheerleader. Her mother was a cheerleader, and. She wanted to break the vicious cycle. And at the end of the episode, Lana set, asks Clark if he's going to play football in, in the next season. And he says, I don't know. My father did it. My grandfather did it. I think I just have to break this vicious cycle. Yeah, those two points are really good of um, showing the connections between those two characters. So there's a lot of character development and world building in this episode. Because, again, we do see those that awesome interaction between Lex and Lionel. And we also get, we can compare the three kind of parent-child relationships. We got Lionel and Lex. We get the one scene between Lana and her aunt. And then we get another, of course, every episode scene between Clark and John. But we also get the scene, like you said, we get the kind of two scenes with Clark and Lana. And then we get the scene of the three of them together, Lark, Lex, and Lana. And to me, like, this early part shows that they really didn't know what they wanted to do with Chloe and Pete, because they're... Chloe's definitely in this one more than the other ones, but Pete's, like, really not there at all. And I feel like they kind of... They wanted him there, but they really didn't know what to do with him, and at this point, maybe they didn't really know what they wanted to do with Chloe. Well, Chloe is... Yeah, this is still where they're in the phase of trying to figure out what's... where the arcs are going to go for the for said characters. Yeah, because Chloe's basically at this point, she's has the wall of weird. She's the head of the newspaper. Head of the torch. She, head of the torch. And she likes Clark. But it's unrequited. Like, it's not even, not even unrequited. It's not even noticed. This is the very much the, um, that kind of late 90s, 2000s teen drama movie thing where she's like the boy or girl who is into the person, but they don't notice them. They're into someone else, and at the end of the story, they're together. But that's the time that this took place. All right, so what is your favorite scene or sequence in this episode? Probably the scene where... Actually, that's that's a tough one. Yeah, I know. I do love the fencing scene, but for me, and it's super obvious at this point, the John and Clark scene is so well done when John basically goes to him, you're meant more... You're meant for more than yeah. football games. Just, like, yeah, that it, one too, because yeah. it's also a near. It's sort of paraphrasing the line from the 1978 Superman movie. You're meant for better things than playing than football. Yeah, it's it's another great line of again seeing Jonathan instilling this idea into Clark that he he will like his abilities should not be used for selfish or monetary gains. We also. And something we also see is I don't know how they did it, but during the the football game, Clark does a uh, a Yoshi jump. Oh yeah, oh it was some terrible wire or if it was wire work, it was so bad. Well, where he's, this is a, he's he does a big jump and he's but his legs are still moving, so it looks like he doesn't know what he's what's happening. Yeah, he kind of like yeah he kicks around like he does like a Yoshi jump. He he jumps and is like just kind of slowly moving horizontally in the air, but not losing any sort of. Uh, altitude it, it it looks so bad yeah, that, the, if anything that would have gotten that would have gotten attention yeah it's like uh so he like he had literal hang time where he was just kind of actually like hanging hovering in, the in the air yeah 
And it was obviously like kind of like, oh, look, he's like sort of flying, but not. And that's about as much flying as we get from him for a while. But it was ridiculous. The rest of the stuff, like, okay, he's not a small guy. He could easily truck these like high school guys. Like that wasn't anything crazy. I don't know. Yeah, that was that goes to the kind of budget of some of these scenes, again, with the green screen, that some of these non-practical effects look pretty awful at times. That would be my worst scene. That or kind of Coach Arnold's, like, level 15 acting at times, his anger. He's so over the... Like, I I love it and hate it at the same time. Like, it's so over the top that it's hysterical, but I don't know if that's what he was going for. My worst scene is part, is actually a character error. It, like, it's a kind con- like A continuity error? Yeah. Well, no, it's an actual character error. When Principal Kwan is t- talking to Coach Arnold, when he first gets angry and the TV gets goes up in flames he walks right past a fire extinguisher and that's the, and he's letting the fire go on <laughs> and i i love imdb for this one when he tried to put it out well that to me that brings up like the problems i have with the coach which is what are his powers because at times yeah, is he, he pyrokinetic is well he... he can he can start fires but then he also burns the kid with his touch later on but then he's not fire retardant so and the TV, he tur- he lights it on fire by turn- hitting the remote control. I thought he slammed his fist on the desk or something. No, he slams his fist on the desk, and the desk catch it doesn't catch on fire. It, it, it like flames from like the desk to the ceiling. Like it is a terrible effect where they obviously had like some sort of gas piping, and it looks like if you've ever been to a Hibachi place when they do like the onion volcano, it's like that, but the whole desk, like the desk itself, isn't on fire. It's shooting flames up to the ceiling. And he grabs, like, the remote at some point, like, right before that, um, and, like, goes to flip on, like, the TV, and then it lights on fire, and then um, the principal, Quan says something, and then he slams his fist on the table, and the whole thing lights up, and the principal's like, uh, okay, and, like, kind of just runs out of there. But, yeah, his powers make no sense to me whatsoever, because he can light water, like, at least those things are flammable, like, but he was lighting water on fire? Yeah. Multiple times. I... There were good effects. Like, I, they, I agree, like, those effects with the sprinklers and the showers were awesome, but, like, they just don't make any sense. All right. Uh, who is your best performer of the week? Most likely John Glover. Yeah, I would Despite say... Despite him only having a, a couple scenes. Yeah. To me, it's still... Um, John Schneider. John Schneider, but they're definitely, like, this is where we get to start to see the... Com- I, I think if we got one more... Lionel scene or one more like Lionel line it would have gone to him but the fact that Jonathan has the scene with Clark has uh I think he has a scene with Martha and then the scene at the football field with the coach and then saving Clark um I think all that kind of leads me and then he also confronts Clark at some point about did anybody see you saving the principal I was like oh you're gonna tell him not to save people no because you're not that Jonathan Kent yeah. Looking at you, Man of Steel. Alright, and then who is your worst performer of the week? Probably Principal Kwan. Him not putting out that fire really bothered you? It, it was, he literally walked right past it. How would, why would you not do something about it? Fire spreads. Yeah, no, I was gonna say Dan Loria, but I'm actually changing my answer to Trevor, because his four of fire extinguishers is the most ridiculous so thing ever. There was also buckets of water. Yeah. Which at that point he had already seen that the coach can light water on fire. Yeah, if he tried to if he tried to pick it up and throw it at him, he'd probably just light the ignite the uh bucket. Easter eggs and trivia. The only thing that we haven't covered that I have besides talking about um the principal is that this is the first episode that Greg Beeman directed, and then he would go on to direct every premiere and finale until season four, and then he would return and direct the series finale. Yeah, he's he's one of the uh, he's to the sh- to this show, or he he was to Smallville what Greg Nicotero is to to Walking Dead, where he's a valuable like a really valuable uh, person in in the production of the show. I mean, he he doesn't do special effects or anything, but he does know how to. He's really great at what he does. I mean, yeah, was, the series finale is small though. I'm gonna say it, one of the best ending, possible one of if not top ten 
best endings of a TV show of all time. Yep. And I do see that he went on to directing and producing Heroes, which is, I guess, why he left the show around yeah, like because, season three, four. Yeah, because it started up production in, I want, I want to say, 05. Because it, yeah. it didn't premiere until 06. So that makes sense. Yeah, that's like the same timeline. And then my last thing is to talk about the, which we'll see for, I think he's in like four or five more episodes. Um, he was in the pilot, but his he got cut out, which is Principal Kwan, played by Hiro Kanagawa, who is the all-star of all-star of comic book and genre-related work. Uh, he's been in three of the CW shows, uh, iZombie, Arrow, and Legends of Tomorrow. And in the Arrowverse, those are two different characters. So in Legends, we got to see him get... We didn't exactly see it, but he gets killed by Grodd. So it turns out uh, Greg Beeman was also a co-executive producer and executive producer of Smallville. Oh. For over 100 episodes. Well, that makes sense. Well, if he's there, I saw that he was still directing episodes like into like season seven. So he probably was on most of the ep- like most of those early seasons, like the executive producer. And he was also a director. He directed three episodes of The Wonder Years. Oh, well, that's a great connection. That's probably how they got Dan, Loria. Um, yeah, so back to uh, Principal Kwan. So he's been on... Those three CW shows, he was also on the, I believe it was on Fox Human Target TV show. Uh, he was on the Blade TV series. He was also in Heroes. Oh, he was on Heroes Reborn when they tried to bring it back a couple of years ago. He's currently on uh, Altered Carbon, and he's done a ton of voice work over his entire career. Like, he has, every, basically, if you watch anything that has to do with comic books or sci-fi, hey, he Heroes has been on Reborn, it. Um, he played the VR, or the the game girl that came to life the one the her bait the girl she was based on was the kwan's uh daughter right i did not see heroes reborn i stopped watching heroes the original show after like season three and i just could not get into heroes reborn i ironically right? i watched all of heroes reborn up until the final the finale <laughs> and now i can't i can't it's unable i can't find it anywhere because they don't want anybody to know about it. But, like, his IMDb is absolutely ridiculous. He was in Man in the High Castle. He is going to be in the upcoming um, Snowpiercer TV show that they're working on. He was on the X-Files for several episodes. Uh, he's been in everything. Of the 100, which is another CW TV show. Almost Human, which was, like, a Fox TV show I watched, which I'm pretty sure... Is that is the... the one with Carl Urban? Yes, it is the one with Carl Urban, yeah. That was a really good show. Well... Carl Urban was really good. Michael Ely was not so good. But yeah, he is like your all-star of all-star um, cast members. And he's very young in this show, which was interesting to see. And did you have any, I guess, Easter eggs or trivia from this episode that we haven't gone over? Well, it's it's actually one that I I never got a chance to... I never got a chance to mention when we did the first episode. Eric Johnson actually auditioned for both Lex and Clark. Oh, really? Well, Whitney... Yeah. Oh, I can see I can see him more as a Clark than I could as a Lex. I don't think he has the gravitas to pull off Lex. Yeah, and uh, the next next week's episode will be there's a connection between Whitney and the character in X Ray, which I'll mention. Okay. I'll mention that next week. All right. And then the only thing that probably would be different today in 2018 compared to 2001, there was what like three scenes of a adult hitting a like a teacher oh, hitting yeah. a, a child like a student like ah like legitimately he slapped and then burned trevor and then punched clark and trevor's said that in the past he's driven he once drove him drove him home punched him in the stomach and told him not to make him a, a certain mistake again yeah and it's different from like and especially in those parts, it's like, oh, this is just, he is just a terrible human being, as opposed to at least in the other things he's like, oh, like the meta powers mess with them. Like, yes, he's trying to kill Chloe, like he tried to kill Chloe and he tries to kill Clark. But at least at that point, you could kind of do the whole meteor rock kind of craziness. But what Trevor says is basically he's always been this guy. I forgot what, it, oh, yeah, it was Captain, it's Captain America, the, or the first Avenger, with the speech that Stanley Tucci's character gives uh steve about it's a type of the about how this the formula enhances the person you are mm, yes so if you're bad inside you're even worse afterwards yeah and 
with next with uh, next week's episode, we actually get the first cryo Edda. What do you mean? Uh, that's my term for. I don't want to use meta because they're not oh. they're not meta humans because they obviously once the we do get metas later on, but these are all like me- are... meteor meteor freaks. Yeah. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll just use meteor freaks. It's I think is that name. what Chloe calls them? Yeah. And that's what that's what it sort sort of becomes a derogatory term to the people. Yeah, I ever, I kind of compare it to um, if you ever watched the old Static Shock show when they called them Bang Babies. Yeah, yeah, but this is this is the same time period kind of as well. All right, so on next week's episode, we will be watching X Ray, and in this episode, we get our first kind of before they were famous. Uh, we can leave off who that person is till next episode, but here's our plot summary for X Ray. Tina Greer's skeleton is laced with meteor rocks. She is able to assume the form of anyone. She assumes the form of Lex to rob a bank. Clark discovers he has X-ray vision. Mono discovers her mother was much more interesting than her aunt ever told her. And Lex turns the tables on Roger Nixon, a journalist tor- turned extortionist, gaining himself an unwilling ally, a Metropolis Inquisitor. Yeah, uh, I wonder what, I wonder, well, my... Do you know who the before their famous person is? Oh, no, I know who it is. Okay. And this was after. Technically, she was in something that, or she was in, she's she was in something that was more cult a year prior. Oh uh, yeah, it is true. But I guess this is around the same timeline. Oh but no, it was the it was the um. It was like two years before this. Yeah. Yeah, but she was also not famous in that either. Yeah, it took a little bit. But I'm trying to look through her thing to see when I would say when she kind of blew up. Well, mm. What I was saying was the character. Is sort of the first meteor, meteor, uh, kryptonite affected person who sort of has a moral dilemma before turning crazy. Okay. Well, I'll probably actually watch the episode once we're done wrapping with this. Yeah, yeah next honestly, week... I, I don't, most of these episodes I do not, I really don't need to watch because I, I just remember them extremely vividly. Yeah, I, I, some of these episodes I, once I start to watch it, I'm like, oh, I remember all this stuff. But, uh, yeah, this will also be our second character who will return in a later season. Yeah, and it's tied to it, and it's really messed up in terms of the character method, or the character's... Motives? Yeah. And it's also, and the end reveal is is pretty sad. Oh, now, now I remember another, another thing I was... I wanted to say when you were talking about the char- the different character, the different actors, and what they have done. Have you ever played heard of a game called Dark Sector? Yes, I have. Michael Rosenbaum voiced that character, the main character in that game. Oh well, I'm not surprised. He has done so much voice work. Like he he is an amazing voice work artist. I would say he's one of the things I was going to bring up, but I decided to cut out was that he actually returns to the role of Lex Luthor. In an episode of the Justice League Unlimited, yeah, when, when Lex does the flip flop between, I think he's aiming for Superman, but gets the Flash, and so he becomes Lex. He, he was the voice of the Flash, and he becomes Lex. So that was a very fun episode as well. And I actually really love his voice of Flash, and that tends to be even now with the TV show when I read the book. That is the voice of Flash that I hear in my head. For me, it's uh, Grant Gustin, but when I when I read stuff with Wally, like Titans. It's still Michael Rosenbaum. Well, that is true. He's playing Wally in the Justice League show, but and that's actually the episode where we find that out. Yeah, and he also he, he played Wally in Teen Titans as well. Yeah, which was considered a companion companion series to Justice League. Mm-hmm. And he kind of he sort of he also played Barry or voiced Barry in Justice League Doom, where they got the crew back together. Yes. I've watched all of those things because anything with Kevin Conroy, I'm in. Yeah, I'm not just. I'm just not a fan of Jason Mara. Yeah, it's just. I don't know. It's hard to become overshadowed, especially even with the Arkham games. That's still Conroy, so it's. He's just. He is Batman. And I think that pretty much wraps up this episode. If we want to get to plugs, I'm Lou. I'm Lou Gonzalez. I'm Louis Gonzalez on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me in the Phantom Zone Facebook group. Uh, occasional guests on the Phantom Zone podcast. I get a ton of my information from smallvillewikia.com, and I think that's about it. You can find me on Twitter at the Alamir. You can find me on Instagram at ComicsBoy. 
where I where I post either interesting or what I find to be interesting panels what in comics, whether they're funny, sad, or or uh, the covers to recent purchases. For example, the next one that will likely that will likely be going up will be X Men the cover for X Men Curse of the Moons trade and the Avengers Kree Scroll War. And don't forget to Lou and I are also on our semi regular guests on the Phantom Zone podcast. Don't forget to listen to that. It's on iTunes, YouTube, FeedBurner. Also, the don't forget to join the Phantom Zone group. We we're past or we're at 250 members, and our latest After Dark, our or the After Dark that myself and Lou were on, is our I believe second or third biggest or most viewed or most listened episode. Is it the Infinity War? No, it's the After Dark, where we were being attacked by the DC fans. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. Explosions. Man, that, that was... I, I couldn't make... I, so I, I, I couldn't listen to the whole thing. It was just... I, I kept laughing. <laughs> Alright, so I guess that's the show, and we'll catch you next time. And don't forget... This podcast stands for Truth, Justice, and the American Life.